Hello, uh, welcome to the select board meeting. Today is December 4th. Um, on tonight's agenda, it's a little bit different from our standard meetings. Uh, we'll be having our preliminary budget discussions. So tonight we'll have a fiscal year 21 budget overview, um, and we'll be hearing from public services, finance, and facilities. So at this point, I'll hand it off to Paul. Okay, thank you. Um, just for the board's knowledge, um, I was in touch with town council today. Uh, your continued liquor license hearing is okay for next Wednesday. So we'll start that meeting at 7 o'clock. Um, he did agree with um, the comments that I relayed from ABCC that the board does not have any grounds to deny the license to any of the restaurants. Um, whatever allegations there are need to be handled separately in the future. And the town council, uh, the fire chief, and ABCC are actually working together on that to come up with things that you can look at. Thanks. So just to put that issue. Great. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't think following along is pa in packets is necessary, but let me just describe that the big budget package you got, um, we're going to go through. That's going to be available in the background should any questions come up. Um, the three departments that uh, Vanessa mentioned are going to make PowerPoint presentations, and after the PowerPoint presentation is ready, I'll have the budget document ready. But I do want to give an overview, because this first page while complicated, is going to explain what you're going to do for the next three days, and it's actually pretty simple when you look at it. Um, this section right here is the current year's budget. Um, it does not reflect November town meeting changes because this is the budget that April town meeting passed, and it doesn't really matter why. Um, as many of you know, the budget total is consisting of two parts, the operating budget and accommodated costs. And again, this is the current year's budget. What FinCom did in the fall was to give a target based on projected revenues and projected accommodated costs of a 3.15% increase. So this column here, multiplied by 3.15%, is this column here. These are the accommodated costs that the departments had fed into that formula, and this would be a balanced budget on the town side, $29.5 million, roughly. This is the set of budgets that you have seen, or you will see, in front of you. So I can show you right here, it's $200,000 plus out of balance. So my job um, will be to add and subtract, but have a net of $200,000 less than what you're going to hear about over the next few uh, next few days. Um, as you can see, we're starting with public services, finance and facilities tonight. Next Tuesday, uh, public library administrative services and public safety. And then we'll wrap it up on uh, next Wednesday with public works. And just to show you, that also includes the enterprise fund. So here's $29.5 million. Here's another $14.5 million, or 156 and again, this is a level one, if you will, requested budget. Uh, this includes using reserves, so I'm not sure that a 6.5% increase is going to be digestible. So I'll also look at this in more detail with, with Jane, especially, and her staff to try to lower that to a, to a different number. And then lastly, on December 11th, and we could possibly do that tonight if we move quickly, I will go over the rest of the shared costs, if you will. Um, they're all accommodated costs. There's an increase of just under 4%. I know you kn you're aware of the pension uh, issue being the biggest one. But again, that's the wrap-up item, but I could handle it tonight because we do have a comparatively lighter agenda um, tonight. Just a couple words on the budget documents that, again, we're not going to dwell on to start. FinCom and town meeting a few years ago asked the town to shrink the size of the budget. They didn't mean the dollars, they meant the document. Um, we were providing way too much detail for many. Uh, that was especially true in the facilities department, but in other areas as well. Um, one of the things we, uh, we did, and, and FinCom I don't like to, was to change um, part of the town staff to be um, support, uh, support staff. And that would be any clerical position of which there are actually five grades on your classification chart get aggregated into one number. So this is the kind of number in Gene's department that town meeting is going to see and FinCom is going to see, for instance. It's a little complicated by using the Munis report, which you notice we don't use anymore in FinCom and town meeting, uh, because in order to do payroll, 
the past number, whatever it was, has to be broken down into specific lines in order to pay people. And I might add, some of these lines are not always accurate, as you can see. They get worked on during the year. For instance, I just worked with Sharon on one of the departments a week or so ago. So in the budget, where there are lines aggregated, uh, all of these compared to this 210,000 is a minus 3.8% change. There's a few examples. Um, all of them are definitely with the clerical positions, but Jean has one with inspectors, which I'm not sure what the final result will be, but it seemed reasonable to add building commissioner. That's a new position within town. It used to just be called a building inspector, but now he is the building commissioner. Um, so you can see the net change between last year and this year is just 3%. Uh, but it's shown in two lines. So those are the two different direction it goes. For, for this budget, for the level one uh, department head requests, um, I ask that um, obviously we honor union contracts and that for all non-union employees, we follow your classification and compensation uh, plan, including a 1% cost of living adjustment, 1% COLA. So you'll see, uh, if you go into the details, you'll see some employees getting a 1% raise. That's because they're a top step. Some getting a 3% raise, most getting a 3% raise because they're not a top step. So they get a 2% step plus a goal. Um, if there's any other sort of discussion needed as an overview, I'm, I'm happy to answer questions and, and help out along the way. Um, at this point, I'll turn it over to Jean. We'll go through a PowerPoint and talk about her department. I, I think it's fair game to, at all times, feel free to have a discussion while she's presenting. And again, the budget document that's now up on the screen, and I know many of you have, is available as a backup if you want to get into specific discussion. So, Jean, let me just shrink that. Yeah. Okay. Um, is this better if I use the microphone? Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you all, and thank you for the opportunity to present the Public Services Department Level 1 FY21 budget. Um, I would also like to ask the Public Services Department staff, as well as any volunteers that are here tonight or in attendance, to step up so that I can recognize them and thank them for coming tonight. Um, wave or stand or make noises. Um, the, these dedicated and talented people are a tremendous asset to the town of Reading, and I want to extend my personal thanks to them for all that they do. My presentation tonight will highlight each of the divisions, and public services is comprised of eight divisions. But I want to make a point of saying that, although I'm going division by division, we are a collaborative department. Um, we work very well together um, across divisions, and uh, we also work very well with other departments in the town, the volunteers, and so forth. Um, I'm going to give you a couple of examples of that. Health, fire, and elder human services. Probably would have been more fun as a game. Um, they work very closely on housing issues, and I don't know if people really realize that. Another example is planning, economic development, and police, which those three don't sound like they go together, but very much do. We are actually meeting weekly to talk about downtown parking. So um, I just wanted to make that point so you could get a flavor of kind of what we do in public services. Um, the level one budget has been created with the within the established parameters that Bob just provided. The budget for public services is a level funded budget. There's literally no increase. It's actually a 1% decrease. Um, I am going to highlight a few things that may be of interest, so that will come later. Um, I also wanted to mention that grant fl funding is um, very much part of this budget, and that veterans services is 75% reimbursed by the state. I think that's important to keep in mind. Okay, well, um, I also wanted to highlight this slide. Many of you saw the presentation we gave a few months ago to the select board, and this is part of our Reimagine Reading. It's part of our um, visioning work for some of the underutilized areas. This is the um, building 
that is, we call it the historic power building over by Reading Municipal Light on uh, uh, the, so there's a parking lot in front of it right now, but we are reimagining that at some point this beautiful building could um, really breathe life into Ash Street and become a real asset for the neighborhood. And we're talking about at some point having this be a community center or an arts center, which I know uh, Matt Cornelis has been working with an arts group and they're very interested. So we're very excited about these, these um, visions for the future and um, I'll be talking a little bit more about them. So this slide is uh, really to demonstrate more of our collaborative nature. Um, we, we work with a lot of different groups. Um, in this slide, you can see there's 14 boards, committees, and commissions. So I don't know if we, Matt and I, might be tied for the most number of boards, but we meet, these boards all meet on a regular basis. One of them is a work in progress, but I stuck it on there anyway. It's the new EDC. Um, I don't know if that's where it's going to end up, but um, the old EDC was in our department, so I'm guessing that the new EDC will end up there. Um, and there's just a lot of volunteers, a lot of working groups, and that's really how we do our work. This is our department. And as I said before, we are four divisions. Um, it gets a little messy when I try to describe economic development and planning, but I sort of lump them together. Um, economic development director and economic development liaison are offset by uh, permits revolving fund uh, dollars. So uh, that's why they're colored a little bit differently, but um, you probably know that. Uh, I also wanted to note that the Economic Development Director, Erin Schaefer, um, she's been with us now for six months and been an integral part of our work and um, that we were very happy to find Erin after the position had been vacant for a while uh, as a result of the previous director moving to the West Coast with his family. Um, <clears throat> I'm also very pleased that we were able to bring back a former employee, our Economic Development Liaison, some of you might remember Jesse Wilson, Wyman now. Um, she left us a few years ago because she went to graduate school to study urban design. And when she graduated, we stayed in touch and she was interested in coming back and doing special projects for us. So we're very excited to have an actual urban designer as part of our team. So this is the Recreation Division. Um, this is a division that's always hard at work, offering hundreds of programs to thousands of people. Working with the youth is the primary focus. Um, besides programming, the rec staff oversees upgrades to the playgrounds, fields, and this photo highlights the Joshua Eaton Playground Project. And uh, another big project that we're working on is the um, Birch Meadow Master Plan which some of you might have heard a little bit about it subsequent time meeting. The Elder Human Services Division is another super busy division, um, especially in this building, so much happens. And I've highlighted uh, some of the things that we get involved in. Really the big thing that um, is one of the major milestones of the past year was getting a new van and we were so very pleased to get help from the state with that. And um, that really um, now allows us to have a second van in service and provide trips and do the kinds of things that the seniors have been talking that, uh, that they would like to see expanded. Um, so Jane Burns, thank you for all that you do. She's had a fun day today. She and I were um, catching up on a bunch of different things and um, it's a really uh, tremendous group of people that do a lot for the community. I also wanted to highlight the work that Jane especially has been involved in in Dementia Friendly Reading and the memory garden that she created with the spinning flowers. I don't know if most of you got to see it, but it was really a wonderful way to recognize um, all of us who have this uh, dementia in our families and we're able to um, pay tribute so thank you, Jane, for that. 
moving on to veteran services. Kevin Bowmiller, thank you for all that you do. Um, another busy group. Um, this assistance that is provided is significant and uh, those resources are so important to our needy veterans. Um, even with the number of beneficiaries slightly down, the needs are substantial and being out in the community is one of the best ways we can promote this service. So thank you Kevin for your efforts on that. Next is public health. The Board of Health and their agents and inspectors are a diligent group that makes sure the community is safe in so many ways. Over 300 annual inspections, 41 annual complaints, and nearly 1,000 flu vaccines were given over the past year. Those are just a few of the stats that public health is involved in and engaged in, and so much more I could go on, but I'm going to stop there. Um, the next is uh, building. And I want to recognize Kim Saunders, our permits coordinator. I call her the maestro of this division. She facilitates the workflow and makes sure that we provide excellent customer service. We have an all-time high in our turnaround rate for permits, and we're very proud of that. The inspectors, they have decades of experience, and over the past year, the addition of the full-time building commissioner has been a major asset to this division. The revenue picture is shown here. It's been a busy year. Conservation, Chuck Tyrone has been um, a mover and a shaker and trying to work with the commission to streamline the process. And that's really evident in this slide. Um, over the summer, there was a need uh, for the for the CONSCOM to add a meeting, which is never a great time. Everybody's dealing with vacations. And on short notice to help an applicant that had a time sensitive project, everybody got together and organized this additional meeting for the board so that we could be responsive to the applicant. And that just shows you the dedication of this group. Um, revenues and activity are consistent and uh, they're a busy, busy division as well. Then we go on to historic, and um, historic is mostly a volunteer driven division. However, staff do provide support as needed. The big news for historic is the rehabilitated historic post office. This is a major uh, showpiece for Reading, and it's one of the few historic post offices that we've been able to find that have been adaptively reused the way it has been. We're excited to see, hopefully, a nice restaurant go in there and some other exciting uh, commercial on the first floor. And this is exactly what we had in mind when we asked town meeting to approve the downtown 40R Smart Growth District. So because of the zoning, this building was saved. Um, it had a very extensive amount of restrictions on it that were deed restricted because it was a historic building. And um, they got through all of that, got on the ground, and we're looking forward to this being a major people generator for the downtown. This is our vision plan for Reading. Um, we talk about the Eastern Gateway, which is in the green. That's sort of the Walker's Brook and Beyond area. We also talk about the connection of the Eastern Gateway to the downtown creating somewhat of a bow tie. And we talk about connectivity between the two areas so that as the downtown grows and prospers, so does the Eastern Gateway. And the idea of a greenway connecting the two is baked into this plan. Uh, the area behind RMLD, which was the first slide that I showed you, um, that's what we've turned, we've, we've called that the yard. And that's an area that we believe the industrial spaces can be adaptively reused. So what I'm trying to show here is that really um, the planning and the economic development work so closely together and it shows you how integral planning is to e economic development and vice versa. Now that we have developed this vision plan for both downtown and the Eastern Gateway, we're working hard on next steps. So this shows you a little bit more of what we're talking about with the yard. And this is reimagining what could be there. And then again, the connectivity 
between what that looks like and what the downtown looks like. And this slide really talks about economic development. Um, the reimagined Reading effort was designed to capture what type of district management organization would work best for the town of Reading and for the downtown in particular. We developed a community-wide survey to get feedback on this and received over 1,500 responses. We learned a lot from these responses and together with the downtown working group and our consultant, which is paid for by a state grant, we have another meeting planned after the first of the year to drill down further and create this tool. And this kind of just shows you the district management organization initiative and how that unfolds. So this is my last slide, which is the budget recap. And as Bob said, um, this is really just kind of an overview. Um, you can see that under the first line item for salaries, we've requested 3.9% increase. Under the second, under expenses, is an 18.5% decrease. Accommodated costs, this is the veterans um, assistance, is where we've mostly had the reduction of 20.9% for an overall year over year of a reduction of 1%. Thank you. Thank you. So, questions from the board? Yeah. Hey, but, um, Gina, last year I believe we had um, FTEs listed mm -hmm. with each department. Have you, have you uh, that get information as well? Um, as my, my understanding was, we were going to do that later on in the budget process this year, so I didn't prepare that now. Will that be presented to and comment? Yeah. Okay. That's my understanding. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Um, any questions? Okay. I'm, I'm trying to match your numbers for a second. So uh, I can help you there. Okay. <laughs> um, I mentioned the November town meeting numbers throw a curveball. Got it. So they are in Gene's numbers. They are not in the budget handouts you have. Um, Thank you. And it's complicated, but. The important thing to remember is November town meeting transfers are not part of the ongoing budget for next year's calculations purposes. They're one-time expenses. There was two twenty thousand dollar expenses in her budget. That's what you took forty thousand out. You get a plus one percent instead of a minus one percent. Got it. Thank you. Yes, just one more. Sorry. <laughs> um, on the, the FTEs, what what's the the timing for that? When did, when does FinCom meet or when? Uh, end of January issue. Some okay. departments may present that throw it together. So Yeah, I think I'd be interested in seeing I know that. I know that in Jean's budget, for instance, she's requested additional hours for two existing employees that are part time and no other changes, so it's not that interesting. Okay. It, that by itself is helpful. Okay. Thank you. While we while we and the board were at our meeting and understand these numbers, can you give a summary of why these numbers look the way they do? Um, sure. The salary number is, again, because there's additional hours requested for two positions. Otherwise, it would be 3% or less. <coughs> Oops, sorry. Hello, hello. Uh, the 3.9% is the sort of baseline 3%, maybe a little less, plus additional hours for two staff positions. Um, the accommodated cost of veteran services, uh, you know, again, was presented. Uh, and then the expenses, if you see that 180000 and took 40000 away, that's the November town meeting impact, so expenses really are flat or slightly off. Um, one was open space, what was the other one? Birch Meadow Master Plan. Okay, so there were two master plan studies for 20000 each. Thank you. Any other questions from the board? Yeah, I'm just helping. I know that I, just, I gather that the budget summary that we got um, is different from this. and. It, Help me understand the the target total is a million. Oops, it's up there in the previous slide. It's one eight seventy six. One eight one eight seventy six. It was in Jean's presentation, right up the top there. 
Oops. Yeah, right there. Right. And, and that's a total of minus 1%? Again, that's based on the difference of the town meeting numbers not being in this sheet here, right. but being in Gene's presentation. So the, the number itself is correct. The percent change, you know, one could go over to the far left and add 40,000 to that, and the percent change would differ. Okay, but it, it's still above the FY21 operating target? Well, Again, there's two hundred thousand dollars cumulatively between all departments above. Um, I certainly wouldn't say that every department has to be precisely plus one three point one five percent, but in total, there's two hundred and seven thousand yeah. more than FinCom has forecast we can afford. Okay. Okay. That's a quick question. I'm I'm wondering. It, it kind of feels like we need a Goldilocks porridge here a little bit. I think that the summary is too too tight, if you will, and the newness is, is way too much, and something in between might be really helpful. Um, it's hard to kind of just take a poll. that, I have no idea what you mean. Yeah, so um, in terms of looking at, I'd like to see a little bit more detail than the summary sheet, but Munis would be an answer to that, but Munis is crazy. I, 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 well, the only difference is the November time meeting transfers, and Jeans is one of the few departments that that is true in. Right, so I'm not so worried about the specifics of the numbers. I'm more okay. in the breakdown of the numbers, kind of what each department inside of public services would so represent. So each division, for instance? Okay. Because this is a big one, right? Because you've got, you got the most, your org chart is quite detailed. There are a lot of folks there in a lot of different divisions. Yeah. Okay. Right. So, so Munis, if Munis gives it, and, and as discussed, that's kind of a too granular, granular A level. And this is a little too tight. All right, so the, the Munis numbers would give you your answer. Now again, let me just find it. There's 40,000 of November town meeting transfer right there. The uh, administration aspect or component of her budget, if you were to take the $40,000 number different, would be about unchanged. All the other divisions are listed sequentially and show the exact change. Mark, correct me if I'm wrong, I think what you're looking for is more in line with what we've seen historically as part of the FinCom meetings, is that correct? Which generally has the breakdown in the packet for recreation, veterans, what their expenses are, what their salaries are, changes within each particular department. Yeah, and I'm saying that although there's not a summary sheet, that's in these budgets. If you continue to scan down, there's one right there. Yeah. So what goes to town meeting eventually has Less detailed than the units and more detailed than the summary. Correct. That's what I'm wondering is the timing of that. When that uh, when Finchon gets a budget until late January. Okay. If there's any specific questions, I can organize the data to see. Um, it's just it's harder to just maybe it's the FinCom background. It's harder to see it in total and, <laughs> and, and, and try to absorb it. Okay. I think, if I may, go off, yeah. I, I think one of the differences here is that this is meant to be the preliminary overview um, of the budgets that are anticipated for each of the departments, and then the staff goes the next step and a level deeper once they do the FinCom presentations, um, which historically the board has attended so that we can see that granularity without going into the ministry. Um, so, yes, but you're ahead of them. That was the case. <laughs> So, Jean, is that your yep. concession point? Thank you very much. Thank you. So next up, we'll have the report from finance. Hello. Thank you. It's hard to fit me. Do you need me to use the mic? Yeah, well. <laughs> Does this advance the slides this yeah. year? Okay. Can't get it to the question. It's not doing it. Okay. All right. This is an overview of how the finance department breaks down. 
We have four divisions within finance, general finance, which is treasury and collections, and then accounting and assessing. And you'll also see all the positions related to each and then the boards that we work closely with. This is the three divisions of finance and their FTEs. There's 12.74 FTEs in total. 6.37 in general finance, that is a treasurer, assistant treasurer, a collector, an assistant collector, and then 2.37 clerks. In assessing, we have 2.5 FTEs. That does not include our regional assessor who shared with Wakefield because he's not, a, he's not a salary employee, but he's an expense to us, so I didn't include him. But if you wanted to include him, it'd be three. And then accounting at 3.87 FTEs. That includes me, an assistant town accountant, a senior administrative assistant, and then a 0.87 administrative assistant. These are the key roles of general finance. The first four relate to treasury and the last four relate to collections. We do payroll for the whole town, RMLD and retirement every two weeks, about 1,300 employees. We also do cash management and reconciliation for the town, RMLD and retirement. We also do all the state and federal reporting for those three agencies and debt issuance. The collectors do quarterly billing of the property taxes for over 9,000 parcels and also all the utility billing that would be your water, sewer, and store water on a quarterly. And then we manage all the tax title accounts which would involve setting up payment plans and such. And then they process all of the payments, 126,000 last year. Assessing values all the properties, that 9,000 plus properties and they do all the field work review, data collection, and data entry on those properties. They also administer all our statutory and local property tax exemptions. They bill all the motor vehicle excise, which was 26,000 last year. And then they also do all the abatements for motor vehicle and property tax. And they do all the maintenance to the property tax records. They do a tax classification hearing for the select board and general public. And then they advertise and administer the new senior tax relief program, which is in its third year. There was 186 applications and we had 181 approvals. These are the key functions of accounting. We process all the invoices and payments, about 33,000 a year. The monthly budget reporting to department heads, budget oversight and support, Munis support and security settings. We also work with DOR on the tax recap, which also involves the assessor. This is the report that needs to be generated for the DOR to set our tax rate and certify it. We calculate the free cash and work with DOR for certification. We also do a Schedule A report to DOR, which is used to compare all communities within Massachusetts. And we do financial analysis and reporting and compilation of audit requests. Oops, one too far. This is our total budget in summary by division, up two and a half percent. And it's broken down by accounting, assessing, and general finance. As Bob mentioned, we are a non-union group and the non-union staff was um, instruct we were instructed to project salaries up a 2% step and a 1% COLA. You will note that we're only up 2.4% because we do have folks at top step and also we had um, someone leave our department and work for the town clerk's office and when we replace that person, we replace them with somebody at lower step so we get savings in that regard. Our expenses are only up 2.6%. The number um, in accounting looks a little higher than the 3%, but as you notice, it's only up $200. It's just an increase um, for professional development, so I have a little bit more to work with to get my assistant town accountant to accompany me to some of the conferences related to municipal, municipal accounting. The biggest change that you'll see in the detail of your packet is in the assessing area, which um, there is a line item for um, professional services. That is where we pay our regional assessor. 
he's that line item is up 3.7 percent and that's just so we can afford to cover our contract with Wakefield because he is actually their employee everything else in our department is pretty uninteresting in that most line items are not going up at all and if they are they're going up very small dollars like a hundred dollars I think the biggest one we have is in general finance five hundred dollars in office supplies so that's all I have unless anybody has any questions thank you Sharon any questions from the board I just have have one um, last year or perhaps the year before I know the select board was very much in favor of creating that backup position mm -hmm. for you and I just was wondering how how that's coming along um, not that we want you to go but it was more of a you know a, a, to have some depth so she is working out famously for me um, it is taking me a little longer to do the year-end processes because I'm involving her in all of it I want her to at least have exposure to it I don't think at this point she could do any of it by herself but she's at least familiar and that's what I'm getting for, you know, looking for each year to gain more familiarity great great thanks right, thank you. Okay. any other questions okay thank you, very much. Thank you. All staff. <laughs> uh, still more people than we usually get, so thank you. All right, next up we'll be here from Joe Huggins to cover facilities, operations, and capital. Thank you, everybody. So we're going to go over uh, the FY21 requested budget. Uh, just put together a quick agenda what we're going to be talking about tonight on uh, the different areas we're going to go through. So that's our facilities department mission. We sort of put this in the uh, budget presentations about five years ago just to sort of give everybody an idea of what we're all about and what we're doing uh, on a daily basis in the town. It's important to note that there's um, under the facilities department, we have the core facilities department, which is the uh, the biggest portion of our budget, which does all the maintenance and upkeep of all um, all the town and school buildings, uh, with the energy budget built into that, and all the expenses to repair and maintain. Then we have a town facilities budget, which is where w which we're going to be going through, which is the town custodial staff with the. Uh, the uh, seven municipal buildings as well as the uh, cleaning contract and the custodial supplies and uh, then I also manage a school facilities budget which are not going to be this will be at a later date with the school department so those are the three portions of our budget so this is the facilities organization little chart we have in, under facilities we have seven full-time employees uh, myself an assistant director uh, senior administrative assistant and four full-time maintenance men uh, it's made up of a master plumber, a master electrician, a master carpenter, and a technician um, that work uh, in repairing uh, and maintaining all of the one million square feet that we have. We outsource a lot of work, and you're going to see that. Um, there are a number of different trades that are involved in maintaining um, buildings with different technology. So where we're light on in, inside people working or in-house people we subcontract a lot of that work out just because of the nature of what we do on the town side we have four full-time custodians custodians that are supplemented by nighttime cleaning in four of the municipal buildings and I just put in there that we have, on the school side we have 20 full-time uh, custodians and a half-time courier this next slide here just gives you a quick overview of the um, the buildings that we maintain um, and the square footage as well as the year that it, they were built and or renovated as you go through there you can kind of see the, the two newest ones would be the uh, cemetery garage and Matera cabin which were added in three three years ago I believe that we started taking care of and again this just gives you a sort of a recap of where those buildings where they are on the school side and the town side um, in the preventive maintenance program that covers all of those buildings. So this is a lot of what I was talking about that that we do um, PMs which are a big part of what we do with maintaining the buildings you know uh, religiously going through and maintaining rooftop equipment, exhaust fans, boilers, 
Uh, you can see that there's quite a bit involved that uh, when a lot of this is contracted out. I will tell you that we do with with adding, we added a, uh, a fourth person and in another slide we're going to look at it. It, it kind of shows people that we try to diagnose a lot of the issues in the buildings to avoid having to call outside contractors in, which works out really well. But we're, we're very busy. There's a lot of work going on on a daily basis doing the preventive maintenance program and just executing work orders uh, for day-to-day -day repairs. We talk a lot about uh, facilities, uh, technology, and we do uh, use it heavily uh, to maintain the buildings on a preventive maintenance work order management asset inventory which helps us age the equipment um, we also do uh, the under reports that would be uh, utility track which helps us track our uh, consumption on all, all three commodities as well as uh, work order um, rentals uh, management or for renting out spaces and activating schedules when people are in the buildings at night um, so that we have heating and cooling available so those are all tied all together which really works out well so this next slide just kind of shows you folks what we've completed uh, for work orders um, in FY19 and FY18 um, the numbers are a little the average for the last three years has been about 2600 work orders since we've been using the work order management system uh, which was launched when I came here in 2006 we've uh, closed out 34,000 work orders just to give you an idea so this next slide here shows you like in FY18 we did 79% um, of the work orders were accomplished in-house 22% outsourced the number went down slightly on the in-house and up on the outsourced uh, with one of our maintenance guys retiring and we had a partial year without a um, without a maintenance man until we hired someone which showed you that we do accomplish more with the in-house guys so we're able to get a lot done so that's why that number is a little different so this next slide just give you folks an idea of what the kilowatt uh, per hour by square foot usage is at the um, at the buildings natural gas that last slide you'll notice that the flip-flop would have been at the library well, before the library was renovated um, the uh, natural gas consumption was higher and the electricity was lower because of the the, the, the heating system we have in that building so they're kind of sort of flip-flop and you can see down at the end I, I believe that's is that DPW garage uh, a lot of that has to do with the nature of what they're doing down there in the public safety buildings. Again, natural gas and electricity because those are 24-7 buildings um, and a lot of what the DPW is driven by weather too. This is water and sewer, gallons per square foot. And you can see at the end, coolage and wood end, both have irrigation systems, which is why they're higher, why they run a little bit more. I showed this slide last night. This is um, the energy savings that we, um, the guaranteed savings from Noresco. I just thought I should put it in here so you folks could again see that um, where we're where we're tracking. Okay, now I'll go into the requested. So for the core facilities budget, the overall increase is 2.88 percent. Salaries have gone up 11.5 uh, percent. Um, that's due to step increases as well as um, one of our um, maintenance men obtaining his uh, construction supervisor's license. Our accommodated costs are down 3% and repairs and maintenance is up 3 What is that? I can't read that from you. 9.4. 9, okay. Um, and that has a lot to do with um, changes in prevailing wage. Um, buildings are aging. Okay. So that, that drives the rates up. And right now we're in like a three-year cycle with our contracts for a lot of the outsourced items that we do. So the overall budget's up 2.88% for the core. You also have a new position request under salaries. That's correct. We have a new position request under salaries um, to um, 
to assist us in um, executing the new security work that we're doing. We're going. We're asking for a, um, a, a 30 hour week position for someone that would be monitoring and um, um, the um, the cameras as well as the card access, which is going to be a, a big undertaking to. Um, put people in the system, take them out. Uh, there's 1,300 employees. Not everybody's going to have access, but a great, great deal of them will. So we're asking for that. And we're also requesting under the core some money in the, um, it's under the locks line. That would seem like the place to put it. Um, and that is for monitoring services for um, the uh, security uh, measures that we're doing. We're going to have to go to a, a more elaborate setup than we have now and have someone, a company, monitor the stuff 24-7. We are doing it now, but it's going to be expanded, if you will, with the amount of work we're doing. So that's, this is the town facilities budget. Um, the overall increase is just under three quarters of a percent. Um, salaries are up 0.74, I believe that says. Um, we had a retirement and a new uh, custodian come on uh, that came in at a lower step, so you can. So that's kind of the reason for that. Um, cleaning service expense is flat. Um, we're in a three-year contract right now, so we have uh, continuous pricing for the next three years. And the custodial supplies are up three percent, which is the chemicals and the um, the paper products that we use to clean the buildings. And that's it. Oh, FY21 Capital, sorry. I just thought I should give you folks a quick uh, look at, uh, this is um, this is what we have on for FY21. Uh, new water heater at the police station, water heater at Parker Middle School, new hot water tanks at the Coolidge Middle School, and we're requesting a Bobcat um, a skid steer machine for facilities so for snow clearing, which will add a second machine to the, what we have down there. Questions from the board? Mark? Um, Joe, do you hit on the CMS, CMMS software, are you implementing pretty much all the modules you want to at this point? Um, pretty much. I would say all that we can sort of handle right now. Um, we did the utility track program um, three years ago. Um, and we went, which helps us track consumption so we can fore help forecasting and things like that. That was a big undertaking. We also rolled out um, FS automation, which ties in like this. I got a phone call earlier in the evening and was wondering if the heat was on in this building. And uh, it was, it was scheduled to come on, but we have a module that you can go in and you can occupy a space by sort of renting it or reserving it and it'll automatically turn it on. So we've got all the buildings that are either rentable or usable for meetings and the school and the town side activated through that system. So we're using it heavily to answer your question. Okay, yeah. Yeah, one. and then second question very much related. The uh, senior center um, usage per square foot is like second or third highest in most cases. Does that relate to the building or is it has a lot to do with the age of the building and the type of heat that's in here that's a um, you know there's it's it's ga it's natural gas but it's a it's uh, a electric motors up in the attic that you know it's you know air handlers and things like that and, and it's a lot to do with the age of the of the building in the use too this building gets used quite a bit is this building one that's in the um, Oresco yep country? it is yep one of those heating systems do for upgrade um, we went through um, two years ago and replaced um, the heat exchangers on all the on all the units in the attic. Um, the, it, they really there's not much to them, but we did the heat exchangers and replaced those, and they're not due to be replaced now for at least another 10 or 15 years. So it sounds like the building is a problem. Yeah. Okay. Other questions from the board? I have a few. So. It looks like the number of work orders is increasing year over year. Slightly, yep. Yeah. Uh, is that uh, is that increase expected to continue? Is it in, uh, so is it a result um, of the building simply aging? It's a result of the buildings aging and the use that we have in the buildings. Our buildings are used heavily at night. Um, there's a lot of wear and tear that goes on, especially in school buildings. And if you look at the like the high school alone had like 480 work orders. Um, it's the largest 
footprint of all the buildings. I don't see that number coming down. Um, you know, newer buildings, of course, you're gonna have less work orders. You would hope if they're built correctly. Um, but um, it has a lot to do with age and use, to answer your question. Uh, so the second part is, do we expect that trend to continue then? They, the amount of work orders go up? Yeah, I would imagine so. Yep. Uh, and then, do we have a comparison of both electric and gas usage year over year for buildings? So the, there's the overview, which showed each of the buildings for a current year. But it's possible to see, you know, one of the things we talked about when you presented was the cost savings that we've had from all these other yep. things you've implemented from a cost energy savings perspective. But <clears throat> what does it actually look like per building? I do have that information. I'd be curious to see that. Yep. Uh, you asked my senior center question. Uh, you mentioned that there's going to be an a new employer, new position regarding the building security mm -hmm. efforts that we're implementing. Um, but this seems to be added as part of the operating budget, and it doesn't seem to be coming out of the four million the town meeting allocated. Is that correct? Perfectly correct. Okay. Yeah. And so that position is expected to be permanent. Then. Yes. 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 Can I follow up on that? Um, from a timing point of view, is that something that is independent of the, the larger project, or is it dependent? Something that the facilities director has to explain to the town manager. Got it. <laughs> to see how far it goes. <laughs> Honestly, I, I can't answer. I don't know. I know it's a longer term, but I don't know how soon. Got it. Thank you. Any other questions? I was just wondering when we uh, could expect a building security project update. I got an email today that I'm getting one next week, I think, so. <laughs> oh, two weeks, okay. So I, I'd have to say in January, February. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's no other questions? Okay. Sure, thank you. Right, thank you. Bob, that's everything on our agenda, unless you had... Yeah, I, I may as well cover something, unless you want to go home before you clock. <laughs> <laughs> questions in my office. I mean, it wouldn't be the first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll help you find what I'm looking for. Yes. It's uh, the 57th page of your budget packet. It'll be right up here, so you don't really need to find it. I'm going to discuss um, what was in that last summary sheet as shared costs. We might as well do that. Um, this first set of costs I'll review, but it's not something town meeting votes on. This is um, state assessments. It's uh, these are costs that are subtracted from state aid. Um, this, it's a long way off before we even see the governor's budget at the end of January. So these are estimates. Uh, but the $42,000 school choice tuition is something that's a little more concrete uh, based on some information we have. You can see the run rate is only $19,000. Um, it had been budgeted in say, 2000 The rest are just guesses at 2.5%. And, and again, there's that what is now close to a $600,000 loss of state aid because we have a train station. These are now some of the light on light items that uh, FinCom and town meeting do a vote on. First is the FinCom reserve, uh, expected to be unchanged at 200,000. That was presented as part of the financial forum. Um, Volk schools is, is always a challenge, as our treasurer is now learning. Um, the, the Northeast Volk School in Wakefield is our, as you can see, our primary Volk school. Um, the budget for that is fairly well predictable within a certain range because they bill it on a one-year lag on the amount of students. So we already know how many students for next year will be part of their budget. We may not know the increase in their budget, but we know how many students. Um, so that increase projected is just about 5%. It's probably a pretty good number. Um, the next two both schools, uh, Essex North, the old Essex Aggie and North Shore combined, and Minuteman are completely unknown. It's always a mystery to both John and I that uh, at this time of year, if we were to call them, as I used to do, they can't tell us how many students are there right now today. I'm ready. I don't know how. 
they have until some period of time, and I'm going to say is it November 1st-ish, where they, yeah. they technically can't count anyone because they're not sure if they're going to stay. But at some point around November, they should be able to know, count the human beings and give you a number. They can't. They don't know. Um, the only reason I know we have a student at Minuteman, because they have not admitted that yet, as you can see, is an $874 charge. I had to pay a one-month transportation charge. So I don't know who it is, but I know we're billed for it, so we have a student. <laughs> so my point in these lines is it's really difficult to budget the two, some two smaller bookstores. Right now, I believe there are five students enrolled at Essex Aggie or Essex North and one at Minuteman, but I can't say that absolutely for sure. Um, of the five that, that I believe are at Essex, two of them are seniors. So in theory, three would go forward. And then the wild card that neither John nor I ever know is how many freshmen will apply. And the reason for the other two both schools is um, it's complicated, but effectively they all they, they reportedly offer programs that our main both school does not have. Otherwise, the students would be required to go to the primary both school. And that's a bit of a marketing effort, as I've learned. Um, both schools create new names and programs and then steal students from each other at a much higher tuition. So I thought I'd just go a little more into depth in this line at it, because we don't need to yeah. talk about that. Excuse me one sec, Bob. Is yeah. there a, um, a building assessment that at some point That's a good question, uh, Mark. <clears throat> My understanding is that I haven't talked to Sharon, but we may either see it as part of the Oak School when they build a new high school, or we may break it out as a fourth line on this line item. Um, the way it's been described to me, and the way it is right now in state law, Reading will be assess assessed the cost of the school construction project based on enrollment, which is, Reading is very low. It's 20 students out of several hundred. Um, the school building was last reported, I think, around $240 million. It will receive I think it's 80% state aid. I don't know what Saugus's rate, which I think is it Chelsea's rate, which is either 80 or 90. It's 90. Okay, so the actual, so you know, the actual cost of this towns, this 12 towns, is relatively low. If only we could get something like that. Yeah. Okay. And again, for Reddit, because there's a small percent of students compared to some of these towns, it's even lower. So it's not a budget buster in this, and it'll show up as an additional charge of some amount once it happens. So far, they have proceeded to do design work and feasibility work without assessing anything to the towns. It's been part of the operating budget. Thanks. I know there was some discussion of both the town meeting and the financial forum about retirement. Uh, this figure here, the 27% increase, does not include the coal the town being approved. Uh, Sharon is working with an actuarial firm to determine what that is. My estimate is another $200,000. We'll see how it comes in for the general fund. Um, once I know what it is, I'm obliged to put that in there and be able to pay the retirement assessment that will happen. Um, in order to afford the $200,000, uh, one thing that's almost for sure going to happen is that the OPEP number will come down from 600,000, probably 500,000. So we'll have to find 200,000. I think this is where we find half. Um, I don't know the timing of this, but I know I need it in order to pass a budget along the fit um, I don't know beyond that when it will happen. Um, but as you can see, the 24%, which will be slightly higher, is by far and away the biggest increase in all of these um, employee and retiree benefits. Workers' compensation is not particularly interesting. It's pretty much flat. Uh, unemployment is, is also somewhat flat, actually slightly reduced. You can see the charges are pretty nominal. Uh, if we can go back a few more years before the override, that's where they were a little more significant. You see some of that here. Bob, yeah. if you go to the top of that slide <clears throat> for the, you know, the retirement assessment, last fiscal year it was almost $4 million, and it's projected for uh, next year, 2020, to be 5.3 million something. Um, is that a normal jump? Or? No, it's definitely not a normal jump. Um, Sharon gave you some of this information at a, at a quarterly um, update, but um, the, the long and short of it is this is a one-time large jump in order to fund the pensions by a certain date. Right. It's real money, but it kind of doesn't matter. 
between this and OPEP, they must be funded at some long-term period. Right. So it's a, it's a way to almost put money aside in your budget, almost like a rainy day fund, and put it to a long-term liability you know about. Yeah. So I didn't have any objection to them taking a big increase. I have to say it turned out to be a little bigger than we thought. And uh, what we learned, and I say this quietly, is whatever they vote, we have to do. I don't want them to hear that. Because <laughs> um, in theory, they could be doing this every year now. In practice, we couldn't afford that. Yeah. Because of health insurance, which I'll get to, this was the year we could afford a big increase. And again, a little bigger than I thought. And so next year, we? Next year, it'll be 4%. Go okay. back to a normal rate. It's oh. actually been closer to 6 in recent years, so we'll go down a little bit. Great. Thanks. Yep. Um, I failed to mention in my introduction that the budgets you're seeing on the town side have a total of four, I'm sorry, three uh, FTEs added or requested. Uh, Joe had one, you'll see another one next week, and this is the third, and this one's a little unusual. Um, this is a benefit analyst position. Um, the cliff notes are, you can see the line that says group health insurance premiums right here. About $11 million, um, projected a very small increase next year. We don't, of course, know what that is generally until uh, March or so. Uh, but our health insurance premiums have behaved very, very well for several years. Very small increases uh, as a running total. A tiny part of that reason is that Maya is not doing as much clerical work as they used to, and it's fallen on town staff. Um, so that this position would be defensive, if you will. Um, if we don't take on more of the work, and, and our treasurer and others have attempted to do this, um, they are not reconciling every health insurance bill anymore they used to years ago. Uh, we need to do that. So this is a defensive measure to make sure that their numbers are accurate. Um, I have no reason to suspect that you know, we're, cheat there, we're being cheated, but this is really just a defensive mechanism we could be saving hundreds of thousands of dollars in one given year and, and maybe very little in another year. So this is really a defensive uh, situation. Uh, you heard an update from HR last night. In general, our HR and payroll functions are pretty thinly staffed. Um, this benefits position, although in this portion of the budget, would probably be a finance person in Sharon's department, but it really does belong as a benefits because that's all they'll do. We haven't really got around to seating, but I think they're going to sit by themselves, have no distractions, and just look at numbers all day long. And if any of you have uh, dealt with health insurance personally, multiply that by thousands and thousands of employees and retirees, it's unbelievable. So this is a, a newer concept. Um, as I've looked um, at the MMA in, uh, website and information, this is becoming a more popular position in other municipalities, probably for the same reason. Is towns are being required to do more than we don't pay for. What's the justification for why not doing what they have done historically? They're cutting costs. So they're passing on the savings to us. And they are. So we just have to use it in some ways in this way. And again, our rate of increase has been nominal for several years, you know, a couple percent at a time when many people are going up five, seven, ten, twenty. Mm -hmm. So I'm not complaining in the least. Um, this is not an essential position. Again, it's a level one budget. I happen to think it's probably a good idea. It's really a question of when we do it, not if we do it. I think we have to do this. It's a question of when we afford to do it. And again, you can see from the bottom line there on health insurance, even with this position added, um, it's, it's basically a zero percent change year over year. It doesn't just get any better than that. Once we add that new position, do we anticipate that uh, percent increase to remain consistent? I mean, I don't, I don't think increase is decide. Yeah, that, that's, that's the key is whatever the influence this person has will be dwarfed by whatever the industry numbers are. Um, so it's really working at the margin, just making sure that we're paying for services we get. Um, it's such a complex area of billing that I know there have been instances where you, know, you have a time to object and that time is a short period of time i forget if it's 30 three months 90 days um you know if you don't catch it in 90 days you own it so again this is a defensive suggestion um medicare not much change that's driven by payroll uh, 
uh, with the override, we did put some money in here. We just don't need to increase it uh, next year. This is what Judy was talking to you about last night in terms of Nurse Judy or Dr. Judy doing her own medical work. Um, this is the uh, workers' comp for public safety. This is the police and fire. So you can see two lines. Uh, it's varied over time. It's about $100,000 in some years. There's 100, there's 100, as much as 120. It varies whether it's police or fire. Um, I don't think the cost of this line item will change if we outsource it the way we described last night because it's a fairly inexpensive uh, cost. Again, that's a similar philosophy to the Maya example I just gave, which is what is our core strengths and what is the core business we want to be in? And having your HR director looking at x-rays, which she literally does, is probably not something you want to do long term. Um, so again, there's the, there's the total on um, benefits. 4%, uh, I'm sorry, 6% uh, is high because of pensions. Without that pension number, this would be a pretty close to zero number. Really doesn't get any better. Um, I'll stop there before I go to the next section. Any questions on uh, employee benefits and these costs? Okay. Bob? Yeah. Um, just so that I can understand uh, better this new new position, she, she, he or she will be checking out money that we pay out for or you put in for for health claims? Um, they will re be reviewing mountains and mountains of paperwork generated by Maya that describe what employees are doing. So for instance, um, the, er the enrollment changes just by with our relatively small workforce are huge. Mm -hmm. People are always changing. They're getting married, they're having kids, they're changing jobs. Uh, teachers especially just have a lot of volatility. So you just want to make sure is that human being still working and ready that we're paying for for health insurance? And again, you have 90 days to figure that out. And then are they on the proper plan? Are we, are we properly doing that? So it's not to the depth of some of the things Judy described last night about what she has to do on you know, things like prescriptions and surgeries and that. It's really just, are they, you know, is the, is the right count out there and the right amount of uh, billing uh, suggested? Uh, in talking to the Finance and Administrative Services Department, the figure in there, 60000 is a full-time position. We're not sure we need to start there, but again, this is a you know, requested budget. Is it safe to say they would then be responsible for about $11 million in... It's kind of close to that, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's a good way to look at it. Thanks. Okay, um, next we'll go to capital and debt. Um, some of the departments, uh, specifically the facilities just did, and, and um, the DPW will describe that in more detail, especially the enterprise fronts. Um, I want to tell you that the level one budgets are the exact same capital plan and debt service that was in the November town meeting, so there's not a lot to discuss but from that perspective. Um, but I do want to discuss because I don't know what the town manager's budget will do exactly, but I know it won't be this capital plan and this debt schedule will be something different. And one of the reasons I know that, and I mentioned at the financial forum, is this capital plan is out of balance. It's actually got almost $300,000 extra that we could use. And I had mentioned that the community seemed interested in having more voice on capital. Um, mm -hmm. you know, probably over the last two years at Emory Town Meeting. And, and this is an opportunity for that voice to be heard. I believe all the items listed under FY21, which again is unchanged from the November town meeting, are still legitimate and high priorities. But as you can imagine, capital needs change almost daily. The importance of what you thought was really important gets passed by something else. So there may be some changes to what's a priority in FY21. But there's also the ability to pay for more. And I will have to decide if no one else has any bright ideas what that is. So I did want to kind of go over some of those tonight. Um, performance contracting was one of the things that has been discussed and was discussed at November town meeting. The current uh, capital plan has $300,000 in next year, July 1st, to get the ball rolling, whatever that means. You saw a presentation last night of kind of the process, so I can't really be too specific. I don't know 
It's just you always need seed money to do some work. It won't be the uh, investment rate audit because that is free. It's, it's other things. And then you can see just below it, debt service is scheduled to begin. This has two years to do its work. We need to come together and make decisions, and then this is the debt service they anticipated. Um, what November town meetings said loud and clear was we'd like to do that faster. So this has not changed from what we designed last summer as we kind of reviewed last night. But I believe this is an item that we will want to advance and perhaps use up some of the funds. Um, Can I speak to this slide now? Yes, sorry. Yeah, get a little bit smaller. It looks like a fit. No, just really helpful. Yeah, so How's that? So it's energy improvements. So, so right now, the uh, performance contracting or energy improvements phase two are just under $4 million just because we started with a list. That, that's really just a placeholder. Um, I had mentioned last night about the $5 million. There's a performance contracting number one, and again, debt service is fully repaid in FY25. Um, so this is an area that can change. Someone asked me at November town meeting, uh, would, you, would it be useful if we move this 300000 up to right now in November? And I looked at Joe, and he had a panic to look. He said, no, not at all. He's busy. Um, but this is something we'll have to discuss, but we might ask for it in April to get free cash in this current year's budget, get the 300000 I don't think it's a huge advantage in terms of whether you get the money in April or July. The point is, if we get it in April, that opens up even more spending for capital than next year's planned budget. So perhaps we could move up some of the items. I don't know. I don't know how realistic that is. Again, I showed you last night an overview that said probably a year from now, I'm sorry, a year from April is the soonest we would have enough knowledge to go forward with a real plan. But that's dependent on how the community gets involved. So that's one area. I have a question. What is the roughly the million dollars? Well, right up like that. Uh, you know, it was a percent of the total spent, not quite 10 percent. So it's purely an estimate. And, and again, from some of the things I heard from the community, especially town meeting, uh, I'm going to I'm going to say that I'm almost sure that 3.6 million is too low. We're going to be back up to 5 million or even more when we're all said and done. Um, the next area where we could do more spending. Uh, the turf two number has come in nicely. It's a million eight or a million eight change, so that project's come in well. Um, here's some of the projects that are not funded, and I'm just going to try to mention each one as we go. Uh, the stadium turf track and ropes course, three plus million, is not as you can see, it's not on the capital plan. It's not funded. The field house uh, floor and bleachers, just a little under two million, and is not listed in the plan. Not funded. These are things that could come into the plan to sell the surplus funds we have. Um, we don't know. It's much too soon to estimate what Killam or some other elementary school space solution might cost. So that's not realistic to change this year. But at some point, that will have to be a discussion. Well, just for clarification, the high school stadium turf is up for budget? Yes. Yeah, that's the three million dollars would be to redo that turf field, to redo the track around it, and it's a small rose course uh, nearby. Most of this uh, capital equipment from the town departments really does not need to be advanced again unless something happens. So there's really not much opportunity or need to move some of these items regardless of their size uh, up any sooner. But the next area that I recall. Um, Bob? Fields, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt, um, but if you just go back a slide to the um, the RMHS building project, et cetera, um, it looks like Turf 2 is 2.2 million, 2 .2 million in debt, yeah. um, and the uh, track and ropes is 3.2 million. And the field house floor bleachers, bleachers are 1.7 million. Right. Um, <clears throat> the elementary school space, which is another pressing matter, it is is only 1.25 2, 
Well, that's the module of classrooms that Tom meeting just approved. Right below it is a TPD. We don't know what the ultimate solution might cost, but it's going to be a multiple of one and a quarter million, sir. Okay, so okay, okay. thank you, yep. thank you. It didn't seem, it seemed too cheap. This is a 99% reimbursement. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, the next area where it's potential that um, you know, we could spend some money sooner is in uh, parks and recreation. Um, if we go back to the, the override discussion and to some smaller degree of high school litigation discussion, in order to be able to afford some of these things, we moved recreation and field work on several years on the capital plan. That was the only way we were going to be able to afford it. Um, so it, again, room in the capital plan could be used to advance some of these. Um, I won't go over each one, but you can see many of the high school, uh, many of the elementary schools have some work. Uh, Parker and Coolidge uh, each have uh, work on the turf fields. Uh, I should say Parker is, uh, would be a new turf field. Uh, and Coolidge would be, uh, I'm sorry, the other way around. Park would be a replacement for 800,000 Coolidge if they put in a new ones over a million. And those are not funded and not scheduled, and honestly, I don't see those as a priority. But some of the smaller uh, school projects, you can see the order of magnitude is 100 or 200,000, could be soon. Well, as we talked about turf replacement, um, is, we talked about sustainability. Is there consideration being given to removing turf fields given the materials they're made out of and the concerns that some parents have raised on that? Um, well, if, yes, but not for the reason you just cited. Uh, the turf fields in Reading have nothing to do with anything you're seeing in headlines. And we've communicated that very clearly through the school community. Now, it, it's, it's open for discussion. Does the community want to have turf fields or grass fields? Why not have that discussion? I wouldn't have a problem with that. Um, my only perspective is when turf fields were first sold to us, they were sold with a much longer lifespan than they actually have. And costs have gone up a lot since we first uh, bought into that. But then, as you saw last night, and you'll continue to see, uh, users of fields in this town is almost infinite. And turf gives you way more time on fields. Uh, it omits um, the rainy season in the spring, except when it's really pouring, but games can be played on turf fields. So it's a fair discussion to have for the community. If you want to go back to grass fields, you're going to have to significantly increase the maintenance costs compared to turf, but this cost benefit. There's a list of projects down here that are more parks and not so much schools. Um, those are also pushed out, and those are in a bond bill. And I'll be irreverent and say a bond bill happens just before elections and it's usually never funded. But Reading was able to get almost a million dollars of its projects put in a, in a bond bill. It's up to the governor to release funds and fund these. Uh, it's up to the state to have surplus and have things in the bond bill as a priority. Um, my observation of Massachusetts right now is transportation is a far higher priority than parks and rec. So uh, although these could be, funded by the state someday, that's, and that's important to note that. We may also want to take things on our own hands and do work on these fields as well. Uh, Washington Memorial, Simons, Hunt, and Sturge Parks. So that's another area where you could spend some surplus. I'm not concerned about uh, you know, known problems with public safety or DW. Uh, and the last area that I think I would have is roads. Yeah. Right now, our chapter 90, I sometimes say 70, uh, funding is been leveled for several years at 600,000. Um, that's this line right here, Grants Various Roads. For one year, we got 900,000 when the state had a pretty healthy year in the budget, and they said they would start increasing it, and instead they went back down to 600,000, so it's really hard to predict. The, the local amount, which really could include these figures up here, sidewalk, uh, curb and pedestrian safety, as well as skin coating and crack seal uh, work, plus just a general number for local roads, has combined to be a number over a million dollars. Um, in a way, um, I'm proud of this because there are communities that put zero in, they just use state money. 
Well, they might put in money for these top two, but they do not put in 400,000 for roads. Um, on the one hand, I'm proud. On the other hand, Reading has to do this because we're a cut through community for so much traffic. So it's not that we're just only being used as a destination town. A lot of people use use our town, and we should put a poll. Um, we could put in any number into this 400,000 locally and argue why it's needed. There's no such thing as a number that's too big right there. Um, you can see, for instance, uh, Lowell Street was a number out here. Just That's a new thing, the town meeting just approved. It's not till FY23, it's $400,000 for a relatively small section of Lowell Street. It would be, it would take a whole year's worth of capital away from all the other roads, so we added it in as separately. If there's extra funding, um, we can again almost find an infinite use to doing road repair. So it's, it's again a community discussion of how to use this, this surplus. And that's kind of a summary of the areas where I think the surplus could be used. Generally, I like to spend money where it saves money, so energy would be a higher priority from that perspective. Um, otherwise, I don't have any strong opinions on those areas. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not in an urgent hurry to turn down state grant money that really is there, some of the parks. Um, and if the condition of any of the parks uh, warrant repairs, we're going to obviously have to do it. Bob, yeah. I, I'm sorry, I have, to, I have to point out the irony that we lose some state aid because we have a train that runs through town and a train stop. And yet, we're spending more money on our roads because we're a cut-through town right. for cars. So uh, it's sort of a double hit. Yeah, and I know uh, my predecessor, uh, Peter, brought a, uh, I think it was a debt exclusion to town meeting probably 10 or 12 years ago, for about four or five million dollars to do roads. And in town meeting, it lost almost unanimously. Mm -hmm. So everyone wants their roads fixed, but they don't want to pay extra taxes for it. So I don't know if the board has any questions on capital. I think capital is still an area that's kind of, as, as you see, right for some discussion because there is some room. And, and you know, as we wrap up the budget next week, I'll uh, explain the kind of feedback I'm looking from you. And this is clearly one of the areas. Do you have any thoughts? So you had asked, you had mentioned that public input is welcome here as far as how we use that 300000 surplus. Mm -hmm. um, what efforts are we making or when is the next financial forum so the public can weigh in? Um, there are sometimes is a January financial forum. I don't know if there will be one this year because that's usually when there's a crisis. Mm -hmm. um, so I can happily meet, meet with FinCom. I think FinCom does have scheduled meetings and ask them to lead that if they want to to lead an effort towards receiving feedback. Otherwise, we just do it ourselves and come up with a different way. I'm, I'm happy for any feedback on that. I know you could make a list of some of the things I just said and then have others just do it on my service. I have no idea what kind of feedback you get. But I think recreation and athletics might get high demand. And, the, and, and, oh, cool. um, and there's, of course, they can always contact select board members, the public can always contact select board members and give their two cents on the, on the capital. Tom, I have a question for Tom. Just one second, let's hear from the board. Why don't we um, put this into a January agenda of ours to make okay. sure that we have a discussion about it and assist and talk about how we may want to assist the other input as well. But I okay. think even if there is a forum, we may have sent to have an hour agenda also. And do a survey of the board. Uh, I mean, I, 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 Mark, I think that's a great idea. At that meeting, Bob, I think it would be helpful to have both of your priorities. Um, I, I, at this point, like your assessment of spending money to save money, especially on the energy front. But that doesn't necessarily mean that's where all of it goes. So if we were to divide it up, if there are certain, I know there are certain recreation needs that are more urgent than others. So if you or the staff could prioritize that list, then that would be helpful for us. Other questions? Tom. Oh, I'm sorry, Tom. Yes. Tom Lyons, the individual that is a school maker. 
I noticed up there that there wasn't necessarily anything about the land around Simon's necessarily yet, that we purchased for 40 years or so, that potentially could have been recreational land, potentially could have been something else. Is it worth thinking about putting a placeholder in there to study that land and what it could be used for potentially? Uh, especially considering recreation is one of the ones that might need to be more largely investigated and invested in. Yeah, that, that's, um, that's actually something I was thinking of bringing to April Town Meeting as a request. Um, it requires coordination with CONSCOM. Um, I believe some of the work initially we have to do or should do is do a real survey of the land. I mean, we have an informal survey. Um, let's get a real survey out there. I, I don't know what that would cost, but it's not a lot of money. And really mark out with a wetland scientist what is conservation, what should be conservation land, and what should be available. And then we should probably go through a legal process to divide that parcel and have a buildable parcel, if you will, and a non-buildable parcel. And then the select board can go through some kind of a process, uh, if they wish, and transfer land to conservation, for instance. And this is on the select board's kind of goals and future agendas generally, but there's not, nothing so specific yet as to actually require spending. And then the whole discussion is once you've done what I described, which I think is the right first steps, what do you do with the build of the land? And that's a whole wide open question. Any other questions? And along those lines, Bob, um, um, can, can we have had that determination made in-house by CONCOM and, and uh, No. No. We don't have the expertise. So uh, one of the things that's not up there is the discussion of kind of community center slash senior center. I didn't see if it is up there. So that's uh, probably something that we should get to the status of existed but maybe not funded yet. Okay. I can certainly add that in as a discussion. It's a nice thing we do like but can't fund. I don't even know what the, what the want is, honestly, other than this building not big enough. Yeah, in the same way probably that we go through kind of scoping studies is probably what we yep. want to do here. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and the one thing, I know I'm preaching to the choir here with FinCom, former FinCom members, but we just want to make sure the community is not surprised mm -hmm. that, oh, we need an override after we build the library. I mean, a lot of us knew that, but we have to make sure the message gets out there that there's a bunch of needs that probably cannot be not done within the prop two and a half tax levy and here they are and the senior center i'm thinking is probably one of those i, I don't know sure. what the options are but i know most of the options i could imagine are not affordable within this category anything else from the board okay yeah, that's it for tonight all right that's it uh thank you all very much for, for coming we'll forward to seeing you next week um, can I have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Is there a second? All those second. in favor? Thanks.